right. Welcome to our second set of notes for uh, marine biology. This is the uh, first set of notes in unit number two. Uh, the title for the notes is right here. It's the nature of water. Um, as an additional uh, piece of information to help you with these particular set of notes, uh, I uh, have found another um, site that might uh, help you out, another video. Uh, this is called the Khan Academy, K-H-A-N. Uh, go ahead and uh, go to that site. Uh, Enter in Crash Course Biology, and then when that comes up, see if you can search uh, and find the one that's Water Liquid Awesome. Uh, the individual who is putting together these Crash Course Biologies does a pretty good job of also explaining the nature of water. Use my uh, information here to kind of get a good base, and then if you uh, have some questions, go ahead and take a look at this uh, Khan Academy. It should help you out just a little bit. Um, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is the water molecule, hence the notes, the nature of water. A couple things for you to be aware of about this water molecule. Number one, that it's a very simple molecule, H2O. It's made up of just these three particular atoms. Now these atoms are bonded together with bonds called covalent bonds. You should be relatively familiar with covalent bonds from back in uh, middle school 8th grade science, talked about it a little bit in biology, the very beginning of biology, which for some of you was a long time ago. So uh, I'm kind of going over that again. Now these covalent bonds, the way that they form between the H's and the O's is that these particular atoms are sharing their electrons. When they share the electrons, it's not an even sharing. The oxygen is actually a little bit larger. Move over here so you can see this a little bit better here. It attracts those electrons to it. And it causes the molecule here to have one side that has a whole bunch of these electrons. You can see these circles here. These are the electrons. They're attracted to this side of this overall atom. So this side here is going to have more of these negative charges to make this more negative than up here. So this is going to be a more positive side right here. There's a name for molecules that have a more negative side here and a more positive side up here. Those particular molecules are called polar molecules. You notice how I have here a three asterisks. It's bold face. It's underlined that tells you that this is really, really important to know what a polar molecule is. A molecule with positive and negative charged ends. Make sure you get that down. Having these positive and naked charged ends allows it to bond with other molecules. You can see in this picture here, here's some other water molecules that it can bond to. We have these hydrogen down here in blue, we have the oxygen here. So we have a negative and a positive. This positive side is attracted to the negative side of another one. This negative side is attracted to the positive side of another one. This particular kind of bond is different then a covalent bond. We're not sharing electrons here. We are actually having the electrons attract those positive and negative edges, and they form particular bonds called hydrogen bonds. You'll notice this one also, bold face and underlined with some asterisks next to it. Hydrogen bonds are the bond between individual water molecules. Very, very important to make sure that you have this definition down and understand how it's different than these covalent bonds. These individual hydrogen bonds, these dashed lines right here and right here, are weak compared to these covalent bonds where they're sharing the electrons. This is a very strong bond right over here. <coughs> Excuse me, because these are weak, compared to those covalent bonds. They can break and reform, so this water molecule may be attracted to another one. These bonds break and they move over. But because there's so many, you'll notice that each one of these water molecules, this one here, has four separate hydrogen bonds that it can form with other water molecules. There's a lot of these particular molecules, and so they have a cumulative strength in the number of particular bonds. That's a little bit about our water molecule. Now, water has some unique properties that are different than other particular substances. 
One of those unique properties that you should be aware of is this property of cohesion, where the hydrogen bonds actually attract water molecules to each other. Co meaning two. So they're sticking these particular molecules to each other. That was the picture that I showed you previously. Second one here is adhesion. If it's adhering, its water molecules are sticking to other materials. You might be familiar with this from getting out of a shower. The water molecules that have come down upon you in the shower, some of them are sticking to you. You're that other material. They're adhering to your skin. The next particular unique property here is the viscosity. That's the tendency for a fluid to resist flow. Now, when we talk about viscosity, think of it this way. The colder the water is, the thicker. That is, there's more molecules in a particular space. This viscosity is really important in marine biology because it allows plankton to use less energy than they otherwise might to stay afloat. That's why in colder water areas, there's more stuff, plankton, floating near the surface for organisms to be able to feed on. We go to the warmer areas, there's not as much stuff because there's not as viscous or the fluid is not as thick. It takes much more energy for them to survive. They don't survive nearly as well. Our fourth unique property is this property of surface tension. This provides a skin-like surface to the top of the water because of the hydrogen or H bonds. Surface tension is the water's resistance to objects that are attempting to penetrate its surface. Some of you might have seen water striders cruising around on the top of water in, in rivers, streams, creeks, ponds. Maybe you even took a rock and, and tried to throw the rock on top of them. Don't do that. But these water striders are surviving because of this surface tension. It's very important. Or maybe you went to uh, Arco and uh, you got that soda cup and you're filling it up, filling it up, and you wanted to fill it all the way to the very top. So you keep going, keep going, keep going. You get this little bubble across the top. That little bubble exists because of the surface tension. And the last unique property that you should be very aware of is that water has a very high heat capacity. We'll talk about this uh, at the very end a little bit more. That is, it's very difficult to lose heat. Water stays at a particular temperature for a long period of time. It's also too, very difficult to add heat to the water. That whole term, a washed pot never boils. Because when you fill up that pot with water and you put it on the stove, it's going to take a while of adding a whole bunch of heat to boil that water. It's also why when you make ice cubes, it takes a while for that water to freeze in those particular ice cubes. So those are some unique properties you should be aware of with how water actually functions. The next piece of information are the phases of water. This is a very important one. And this is important because we utilize this information throughout the rest of the course quite often. Some of you are gonna be more familiar with the phases of water than others. But most of you should be pretty familiar with the solid phase of water, ice. When water is in this solid phase, the molecules of H2O are not moving around. The hydrogen bonds have created an even spacing between all of these molecules. They're frozen there. And because they're frozen in this even spacing, there's actually gaps in between these particular molecules. The second phase of water is liquid. This liquid, what we call water, typically, is where the molecules are moving around with some speed. There's not an even spacing. Just to illustrate this, you can look at these two pictures over here and see the difference. Here is ice. You can see the spacing between these particular molecules. But here in that same space is liquid water. A whole bunch more molecules moving around. These hydrogen bonds constantly breaking and reforming so you can fit a lot more molecules into that particular area. And then the third and final phase of these phases of water is our gas phase. That's what we call water vapor. These are the molecules that are moving around very fast. They're moving around so fast they can't form these hydrogen bonds and so they're leaving 
and escaping out into the atmosphere. Now, the energy that is added to change this H2O from the solid to the liquid to the gas is what we call the latent heat. The latent heat is the energy that's added throughout this particular process. Latent heat of melting, don't think too hard. This is the heat that's added to go from ice to water. The latent heat of fusion, oh, that's a different one. Things are fusing, they're coming together. The latent heat of fusion is actually the energy that is lost to go from water, liquid water, to solid ice. The latent heat of vaporization, again, vapor, so we're here with the water vapor, that's the heat added to liquid water to form this, uh, sorry, this gas, this water vapor. And then condensation, that's the heat that is lost from this water vapor to go back to this liquid water. Now the thing for you all that you really have to make sure to understand, other than, of course, the three phases and what's going on with the molecules, is you really need to understand this last bit right here that water is most dense right before it changes into a solid. That's when our water is the most dense, period. <clears throat> Speaking of that density of water, let's take a look at this density of water just a little bit. What is density in the first place? Density is the number of molecules in a given space. So we can have a whole bunch of molecules when it's solid, but there's some gaps in between them taking up a particular amount of space. When it becomes a liquid, we have that same space, but there's a lot more molecules packed into that particular area. The thing to remember that's different and very unique about water is that solid water is less dense than liquid water. That is ice, it floats. And that's different than most every other substance on this planet. Most substances, when they're solid, they have more density than as the liquid. And so these particular substances, because they have that, the solid is going to sink. Well, ice doesn't do that. And that's extraordinarily important for life as we know it on this planet. Otherwise, we would have ice down on the bottom of the ocean where we have life right now. And this ice would form on the bottom and go all the way up to the surface, so we would have solid blocks of sections of our ocean. Now, having these density differences in the ocean forms layers, and you can kind of see this in the uh, sketch right here, where we have this warmer water up here, we have cooler water sinking. This cooler water is where water is the most dense, so this cooler water is going to sink down towards the bottom, so we're going to have this very cold water on the bottom, which is what we actually end up having. So these layers are differences caused by the change in temperature and the change in salinity. We'll talk about the salinity, that's the saltiness of the water a little bit later. Thing to remember about these density differences and our layers is this last bit down here. The high density is always below the low density. So just because it's low in the water doesn't mean this is low density, this is our high density water down here. Now seawater, it has a higher density than fresh water. So the saltier the water, the higher the density it's going to sink. The fresh water, and think about where it rains, adding fresh water here to the uh, top layer of the ocean, is going to stay up above this colder, saltier water. Now speaking of salinity and salts, let's talk a little bit here about what salts and salinity really are. Salinity, it's not just NaCl, the salt that you have on the table. It's the total quantity of all dissolved inorganic solids, not just salt. We express this or show this, kind of like we'd say grams or inches. We express this in something called parts per thousand. It looks a little bit like a percent sign. But there's one zero up above the slash and two zeros below. That's how salinity is written. Now water is our universal solvent. That is, it breaks things down better than any other substance. And it does that because of its polar nature. Now, sodium chloride, that NaCl, is the most common of these dissolved solids here. 
That's why when we taste the ocean, we taste this saltiness. But it's not the only one. The saltiness of the ocean is not the same everywhere in the ocean. It varies. Near the mouths of rivers, where there's a lot of fresh water coming in, it's near zero. It's very low because there's so much fresh water. In confined regions, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, it's very high, 40 parts per thousand in those confined uh, arid regions. Because if you think about those particular areas, the sun is shining down, a lot of evaporation, so the H2O is leaving, and what's left behind is the salt. There's also, in those arid areas, not a lot of rainfall and not a lot of rivers bringing fresh water into those particular locations. So we have very salty water that's left behind. Now, one of the things that scientists have figured out with the ocean and with this salt water is something called the principle of constant proportions. This is stating that the proportion or the amount of dissolved solids, salts particularly, never changes, only the relative amount of water. Let me explain that really quickly. In my fish tanks in the front of the classroom, I forgot about this the very first year that I had them. As the water levels dropped due to evaporation of that H2O, I would mix up salt water and pour salt water in. And then the water levels would drop, I'd mix up salt water and add more salt water. And then I, the water levels would drop and I'd be adding more salt water. You notice how I didn't say the salt water levels dropped. Just the water levels dropped. What I should have done was add just fresh water because I still have all of the salts. The amount of salts don't go away. They stay in there, in my tanks, and in the ocean as well. It's the amount of water that's going to change, whether we have rainfall, whether we have rivers, whether we have a lot of evaporation, the water amount is what's changing. Now the average salinity in the ocean, despite having these variances here, the average salinity uh, in the ocean is 35 parts per thousand. That's the average, not every single place, but that's the averages. Now, because there is this salt and this salinity that is in the ocean, the seawater acts differently than the freshwater. We have what we call the colligative properties of seawater. You are going to need to know these colligative properties of seawater. What are the colligative properties? Here's our definition. They're the properties of a liquid that are altered by the presence of a solute. Fresh water doesn't have these. That's that pure water. I'm sorry, pure water doesn't have these. Fresh water has some, because even though that is fresh water, there's still some things dissolved in it. Think about that Folsom Lake just up the road. When you go to Folsom Lake and you look at the lake, it's not perfectly clear. There's stuff in the water, and that stuff is what we call this solute. Now the particular colligative properties are going to be as follows. Number one, it's the ability to conduct an electrical current. That is the NAs and the CLs making up that salt. Specifically, those are electrolytes. That's what's in Gatorade. We need that in our bodies. It helps conduct electrical currents. It actually helps in our bodies to send signals for our nerve cells. Number two, the decreased heat capacity. I talked about that water needs a lot of heat. Well, when you have salt in the water, there's less heat required to raise that temperature. That's one of the reasons why we put salt into the water when we're making pasta. Number three, raised boiling point. When we put that salt in the water when we're making pasta, it requires less heat, but it boils at a higher temperature raises that boiling point, which is good for the ocean because the sun is shining down all the time, heating up that water. Well, it's not going to boil because that sun's going to need a lot of energy to get that water temperature above that particular boiling point. Number four, if the boiling point is higher, then the freezing point is lower. So a decreased freezing temperature, it lowers, uh, sorry, it freezes at a lower temperature. That's why we put salt on the roads in the mountains up in the Sierra Nevadas during the winter time. Number five is slowed evaporation. Those salts, the NAs and the CLs, that water has broken apart are holding tightly to the water molecules. They don't want to leave. And so it's very difficult for 
this heat to increase the speed of those water molecules so that they become a gas and break those hydrogen bonds and are released from the salts which are left behind. So it's due to that attraction between those ions, the salts, and the water. And then lastly is number six, the ability to create osmotic pressure. And that osmotic pressure is really quite important for organisms. Osmosis, the movement of water from a high amount to a low amount. So when we're talking about ocean organisms, there's a particular amount of water that's in their cells. That water is going to want to leave those cells if they're in a particular location in the ocean where there's more solute, salts, dissolved in the water. So organisms that live in the ocean have to deal with this osmotic pressure. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things and some of the activities that we're going to do. This is the basic information that you should have down for the notes on the nature of water. And again, I recommend going to that Khan Academy video to get even more information and more explanations for you.